from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Kevin Sullivan. I'm the Sunday and Features Editor of the Washington Post, uh, which is a charter sponsor of this event. I have to say that as a, as a longtime and very loyal employee of the Washington Post, I've always found Timothy Egan of the New York Times to be just incredibly annoying. <laughs> the guy is freakishly talented. He's also a very nice man, which I hate even more. He was part of the 2001 uh, series in the New York Times called How Race Has Lived in America that won a Pulitzer Prize. Not satisfied to squash the opposition that way, he had to go on and start writing books. He wrote one called The Worst Hard Time, which is a history of the Dust Bowl, which naturally won the National Book Award. <laughs> Most recently he's written, and what he's here to talk about today, is a book called The Big Burn, Teddy Roosevelt and the Fire That Saved America, which details uh, the Great Fire of 1910 that burned about three million acres and helped shape the modern U.S. Forest Service. So Tim, I just wanted to let you know if you get tired of conquering the world and you want to come for work for a real newspaper, we have a space for you at the Washington Post. <laughs> Welcome. Now, the Washington Post, is that a newspaper? Are you <laughs> still being published, uh, some kind of website? Um, no, thank you so much. As a fellow Irishman, I'm, I'm cutting him tons of slack, and I told him I have the last word. Welcome, all of you. Thank you for coming to this event. Uh, I am a native of the Puget Sound region in Washington State, and um, I think our high today is probably going to be 62 degrees, so I wish I could just hook up a giant vent to that natural air conditioning that comes off of Puget Sound and pour it all into here and give you a little bit of what keeps us cool, but I can't. So instead, I'm going to talk briefly about the biggest wildfire in our history and two remarkable characters, President Teddy Roosevelt and the incredibly eccentric Gifford Pinchot, and how these two Easterners, these two sons of privilege, actually changed the country for the better and forever through this fire. So let me talk about this, just give you a sense of the size. It was exactly 100 years ago last month, August 21st, 1910, that a wildfire broke out in the northern Rockies and we have never seen anything like it since. In 36 hours, a day and a half, three million acres burned. Now, how big is three million acres? Well, as a Westerner, it doesn't seem big, but it's the size of Connecticut. So it's all of Connecticut burning border to border in 36 hours. This fire destroyed five towns, removed them from the map, it killed about 100 people. It burned in excess of 2,000 degrees. It le leapt from tree to tree going so fast that men and horses could not outrun it. It was an absolute disaster from every point of view. Loss of lice, loss of woods, loss of an ecosystem, except for it changed America. It had this ironic effect of saving the fledgling United States Forest Service and therefore saving this public land's dream, which was just this little fledgling thing that Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot started and was nearly dead when the fire happened. So I, I started out wanting to tell a rather classic story of human beings versus nature. And that's really what I'm drawn to. That's why I love the Dust Bowl story because you have this lack of hubris, you have people pushing the earth to the extreme, you have people thinking they can outwit mother nature and then nature gets its revenge. And I saw that in this fire, too. And I was going to write this story that was just going to be this gee whiz, how cool is that fire story about, you know, incredible temperatures and people diving into streams and having little straws for air while the fire jumped over them so they could live and hope that they, by being in the stream, it would, it would spare their life. But I got so drawn to this fabulous backstory of Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot. Now... A quick word about Roosevelt, most of you already know this. He was our youngest president. Of course, he became president after McKinley was assassinated. That's youngest to assume the presidency, not elected. He wrote 14 books before his 40th birthday. He was a very sickly child. He was told that he would have to cultivate a life of the indoors, that he should stay away from the outdoors. And he said, I will not live that way. I will will my way to strength. So he built his body up in college. He defied the doctor's predictions that he could not be a man of the outdoors. And when he was young, he fell in love with this absolutely gorgeous woman he met at Harvard. 
and wrote these sonnets to her and talked about her being the most perfect thing that he had ever seen or met, marries her, gets a career in New York politics in the New York Assembly in the reformist branch of the Republican Party. In his young 20s, he's the, on his way to being the top-ranking Republican in New York Assembly, and then something absolutely catastrophic happens to him. On Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1884, his wife, his beautiful young wife, is giving birth to their first child, Alice was her name, on their home across the street from Central Park on 57th Avenue in New York City. She dies at childbirth. Roosevelt is absolutely struck. He's stunned. He goes upstairs to the top floor of this townhouse he's living in, and his mother dies on the same day. So Teddy Roosevelt loses, loses his wife and his mother on Valentine's Day, 1884. And for those of you who are privileged to have looked at the, his diaries here in the Library of Congress, as I did, you see on February 14th this great writer, this prolific author, this most amazing, this man who, was, who could dash off 10,000 words before noon in letters and prose, writes a single thing on the diary page on February 14th. He writes a giant X. And he writes underneath that, the light has gone out of my life. So he resigns his position in the New York Assembly. He gives his young baby daughter to his sister to raise. And he goes out west to the Dakota Territory. And there he lives for almost two years in about an area the size of this stage. He has his books and his buffalo rug. And he has his fireplace. And he runs cattle 14 hours a day. And the West makes him whole again. The West makes, gets rid of his grief. And so he says later, I owe more to the West than any other man can ever imagine. But something else happened to him when he was out there. He saw that the Eden of America, which he'd always dreamed of as a little kid, the bison that roamed the plains, the birds that blotted out the sky in the Pacific Flyway, they were disappearing. That we were killing this Eden a hundred years into our nation. So it makes a sort of conservationist of him, even though there is no such word. Now, fast forward. McKinley is assassinated. Roosevelt is hiking in the Adirondacks. He comes down prematurely, it turns out. They tell him McKinley's probably going to live. Roosevelt goes back up into the Adirondacks. The Secret Service comes and gets him again. And he comes all the way out by horseback, by hiking, by buggy. And this time McKinley does die, and Roosevelt is made our president. And he says, I wanted to transform the Republican Party, these are his exact words, into a fairly radical party. And part of his dream is conservation public land, that we're not going to be like Europe, where though you had asked the lords of the manor if you wanted to use the woods, we're not going to be like England, where less than 1% of its land is owned by the public. We're going to take the great public domain that left over from Louisiana purchase, all the land that we purchased from the European nations, the land we'd push the Indians off of as well, and we're going to give it to the public. And in order to do that, he needs Gifford Pinchot, who is this, I said, incredibly eccentric person born to vast wealth. He grew up in gray towers in Pennsylvania, a castle that had 63 turrets and 27 fireplaces. And he sleeps on a stone pillow. He goes out by himself and, and prefers sleeping on the ground. He's an aesthetic. He's a very odd individual. People can't figure him out. But he also sees that this great dream of America is being ruined. So Roosevelt gets Pincho on as his top eight. Now, Pincho is to Roosevelt what Rahm Emanuel is to Barack Obama. He is Karl Rove to George Bush. And they write that the way they came up with the idea for conservation was during these episodes of skinny dipping uh, in the Potomac. So the Secret Service would hold their clothes, and they would be swimming nude. And one time, the French ambassador joined them. And uh, Roosevelt says that the French ambassador said, I, I insist on keeping my gloves nude except for his gloves. And he said, why do you do this? And the French ambassador said, there might be ladies present. <laughs> so this is who these two individuals are. They're, they're rugged outdoorsmen. They go for these triathlons, essentially, up in Rock Creek Park, where they'll pound out a six-mile hike, scale these rock walls, and end up swimming nude in the Potomac. Again, I can only imagine Emmanuel nude in Potomac with Obama. <laughs> Talks about health care reform. Um, and, one other thing, just to throw another, another variable into this, the love of Pincho's life had also died. This woman he was madly in love with had died at a young age, 
But Pincho then, because it was a psychic age, fell in love with the ghost. So for 20 years, Pincho, it, this is a secret that was not deciphered until 100 years later, he was spiritually sealed to a ghost. So he would write in his diary, had a great dinner with Teddy. Laura enjoyed it as well. And who is Laura? Laura is the ghost who he appears with him. And he wrote this all in code. He would say, another bright day. Bright day meant Laura appeared that day. Or he would say, a cloudy day when his long lost love did not appear. So these are the two individuals founding American conservation. Now, one more thing and I'll get to the fire. They're gifted as you should be in politics by having fantastic enemies. It is the Gilded Age. It is, there has never been a greater disparity of wealth in our history, well, until just a few years ago, as a matter of fact. Um, so you had this one United States Senator, Senator Clark from Montana, whose dream in life was to be the richest person who ever lived. And he accumulates $200 million in the copper trade, and he moves to New York. He's the senator from Montana, and he builds this mansion in New York, and he never goes back to Montana. And his one goal in life as a United States senator, his one goal is to stop the creation of the United States Forest Service. He thinks this is horrible that they're going to give the land to the people. The land belongs to the Gilded Age robber barons. They can't do this. Now, Mark Twain had called this Senator Clark, just to give you a sense of how well, you know, we've sort of lost the lost art of insults, but this is what Twain said about Senator Clark. Quote, he is the most disgusting creature that, that the Republic has yet produced. Succinct to the point, you know, nails him. So this is his enemy. Also, he had an enemy in J.P. Morgan. When Roosevelt left office in 1909, he went off to Africa, and Morgan famously said, I trust some lion will do its duty. He loved this. He welcomed this. Roosevelt welcomed their hatred. He was a traitor to their class. He said once, there is not in the world a more ignoble character than the mere money-getting American, insensitive to every duty, regardless of principle, bent only on amassing a fortune. So their outlet is the Forest Service. They create by executive order more than 200 million acres, who are, which is land that belongs to you and I. And they always talked about it belonging to the little people. They would use that term, little people. Um, I guess it didn't really mean people under five foot four, but that's the term they used. And so he leaves office in 1909. Taft takes over, President Taft. Taft is the exact opposite of Roosevelt. He's 350 pounds of insecurity. He claims all he wants to do is take a long bath in the afternoon, have a nap, and eat in peace. He's conflict averse. And so he lets the conservation dream die. He lets this thing that Roosevelt and Pinch have put together just lets Congress nibble it to death. And they're dismantling the young United States Forest Service. It's five years old when on August 21st, 1910, a wind comes out of the southwest and kicks up into 70 mile an hour winds and starts this giant conflagration. And that becomes the big burn. Now, we had never tried to fight a wildfire as a nation in our history. We do now. Anyone who grows up in the West knows that summers are full of yellow-shirted men and women going around from fire to fire, and half the budget of the Forest Service is trying to prevent wildfire. But we never did before. So they assembled an army of 10,000 people, mostly immigrants. They said, um, in a quote from Collier's Magazine, they were Scotsmen and Negroes, Italians and Danes, Mix, Max, and Scandahoovians. And on top of that, you had African-American soldiers, the Buffalo Soldiers, who were always sent around the West to do the sort of dirty work. They had to put down the labor insurrections. They had to uh, go into towns that were under martial law for, for different um, labor problems. They were sent to fight this fire. So you had in place the young United States Forest Service, all these immigrants. I traced the death of these two Italian boys who'd come from this little tiny village on the Italian-French border and ended up dying in the American West for 25 cents an hour in the service of Gifford Pinchot and Teddy Roosevelt's dream. You had this entire army of people, but they were helpless, absolutely helpless when this fire blew up. You know, there was a great t-shirt that um, I saw after the San Francisco earthquake, which I covered for the New York Times in 1989. You remember that was the World Series between um, Oakland and San Francisco, and the uh, earthquake interrupted the World Series, and people had this t-shirt that said, nature bats last. 
And that's the story of the Dust Bowl. It's also the story of this fire. They had 10,000 people in place, and they couldn't do anything. They were utterly helpless. Now, I want you to imagine what a 70-mile-an-hour wind is like. It's classified officially as a hurricane force wind. And I was a knucklehead once for a um, History Channel documentary where they're recreating a Dust Bowl storm, and they fired up these giant fans. They said, Tim, just get up there in the ground over there. And they brought this flatbed truck in, these two giant fans. And they said, we're going to whip this thing up and see what it does to you. So they got up to 45 miles an hour, and they're like, <laughs> they got up to 50, and I'm holding my ground. When they got to 70, I was a tumbleweed. I was just completely thrown back. That's what this fire was, except for it was carrying you know, embers the size of a horse's thigh and just burning detritus, and it was leaping from treetop to treetop. It was an utter, they, they call these fires blow-ups. They create their own weather systems. It, it's, it's, it's a beast in search of oxygen. So men would go into these mining shafts to try to hide it out and think they, could, they would live, and the fire itself would steal the oxygen out of these mining shafts. It would find them. You had whole platoons of people died in these mining shafts, not of, not of the fire itself, but of the oxygen that came and got them. So the fire lasts 36 hours, burns the 3 million acres, burns the five towns to the ground, kills 100 people. But Roosevelt uses it, as do all great politicians, as a mythic turning point. These brave young Americans died on behalf of the conservation dream. He makes it like losing warriors in battle. He makes it not a losing cause, but he makes it a calling cause, something that is worth fighting for. So what happens? You owe most of your force, your national force, in the East Coast to this wildfire because there was a bill in Congress that had been stalled through all of Roosevelt's administration that would have created national forests in Virginia, Pennsylvania, New England, all throughout the East Coast, and it was always stalled. After the fire happened, and these young men were heroes, it changed almost overnight. The act passed, the Forest Service was expanded, and the Forest Service was saved in and of itself. So, you know, great politicians use events. And, you know, not even great politicians, but throughout history, going back to the earliest times, people have used events, battles, catastrophes, things to mold public opinion, to say, and this really was the founding myth of the United States Forest Service. So in conclusion, our legacy is, I, I mentioned this in a column the other day, and I, I got a lot of email notes from people in Europe who were just actually jealous, and I was sort of rubbing it in to old Europe. We have an area twice, twice the size of France that belongs to all of us. And it's national parks, it's national forests, it's Bureau of Land Management, it's national wildlife refuges, all of it is ours. It's our birthright. You're born an American citizen, that's yours. And my idea is that we owe this, the survival of this public land stream to this one event from 100 years ago. By the way, and I'll take some questions in a moment, you can still see if you go back, as I did, to the northern Rockies in Idaho and Montana where this fire burned, some of the skeletal remains of this great fire. You'll see standing, charred, just real darkened little skeletons, bits of cedar or pine that were part of this thing. But you can't see any indication of the towns. I walked into these towns that were some of the most brawling, wide open saloon towns. One young United States forest ranger, when he was sent to one of these towns, they were in the national forest, but they were, they were like deadwood. They were like you know drifter workers working on the railroad. One forest ranger, fresh out of Yale, which Pinchot had endowed to make the first forestry school, was shocked. He sent a telegram back to Missoula with Forest Service headquarters. He said, two undesirable prostitutes setting up business on public land. What should I do? And some smart aleck got a hold of the telegram in Missoula, and he wired back, get two desirable ones. And um, I was speaking last fall in California at a bookstore, and a woman came up to me, and she pulled out this little plastic folder, and she showed me the telegram. It said, get two desirable ones. She said, that was my grandfather. 
And I said, that's so cool. What a line. You know, what a great line. So our legacy is we have a United States Forest Service now that's among the, you know, people don't think well of federal workers generally when you look, pull them. But it, the Forest Service and the Park Service is very well thought of. And our legacy is that public land as well. So thank you. I'll take some questions. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. One is, how did you get into this story? I mean, how did you get motivated to do a story on the Big Burn? It doesn't normally roll off one's tongue. And uh, second of all, how do we capture this moment of the BP oil spill, et cetera, et cetera, to move the conservation movement yeah. further into energy conservation? Yeah, great questions. In case you didn't hear, she said, how did I get the story, basically, then how do we capture this moment? Well, I grew up in the West. I'm a third generation Westerner. and you know, we were a big Irish Catholic family, and we didn't have a summer home. We didn't have any extra land. We had the National Forest. So my mom would haul all seven of us Egan kids, because my dad didn't like to camp. Uh, and we'd go out in this giant, smelly canvas tent, and, you know, seven kids. I mean, it was great for us. My mom went crazy. But um, I love public lands. I learned to love, you know, the high mountains of Montana, the trout streams of Idaho these beautiful lakes that you dive into, just like Pinchot and Roosevelt, you skinny dip in them. Um, and I'd always sort of heard of this fire. It had this sort of, you know, the big burn was background. Oh, you know, the big burn was one of these mythic, lost to the mists of time sort of thing. And then when, after I wrote the story about the Dust Bowl, I guess I wanted to move from one element dust to another fire and just sort of go through the big elements. And again, I wouldn't have done the book if it was just about the burn itself, but I got so entranced by these two characters, Roosevelt and Pinchot, and the early founding of the Forest Service, and the echoes of our age right now, the fact that it was the highest, the peak of immigration, that um, they actually passed laws to keep Italians from coming into the country because it was the peak of Italian immigration. There were two million Italians a year coming into, and a lot of those guys, well, not a lot, but a number of them died in this fire. I mean, it was amazing to go to Italy and see this grave in this tiny little village up in the Italian, not the Dolomites, so on the French border, and, and g listing the name of these two boys, say, died in the American West, Morto lo Veste Americano, uh, in this big fire. So I love the parallels story to ours with the immigrants and um, with just the fascination of how you found something like that. Uh, as to the other thing, how do you keep the movement going? There's only really one way. I don't look at this as a political thing. I know it probably sounds political. You know, love of the outdoors is something that, it's like religion, I guess. You, you have a moment at some point where you see something that's beautiful, or you, you're on a walk, or you're going for a swim, or you, you catch a fish, or you, you see a sunset. You just have some connection to nature. You can't argue this abstractly. You can, but it won't win converts over. What happens is you have magical moments. And I think now I was happy to see the National Park visitation figures are up this year after being down for 10 years. And you know what's the most used land in the United States? It's Gifford Pinchot's National Forest. They get something like 400 million user visits a year. So I think that's how you renew the dream, is you make people fall in love. You introduce children to the outdoors. All my kids, you know, hike with me and love it, to an extent, as long as they can text and stuff. Um, <laughs> So that's it. I went on too long. Yes, sir. How did Teddy uh, Roosevelt uh, respond or react to Gifford's uh, believed uh, spiritual relationship with this dead person? Uh, did, did he believe she was with him all the time, or did they have to use a medium to no, communicate? No, uh, you can imagine what a scandal it would be, again, if it got out in the press, chief aide to president lives with spirit. Um, no, it was an age where a lot of people were visiting mystics and going... And I saw one of the letters that said to Pincho, he shouldn't use these mediums. He should use the better known mediums. Uh, they said, don't use these promiscuous mediums. They'll sometimes bring other spirits into the seance. Um, but Roosevelt never knew. It was the best kept secret of Gifford Pincho's life. It was only deciphered about 10 years ago by a scholar who noticed how he would talk about Laura, that was the woman's name, by these coded words, by saying a bright day or a cloudy day. Now. Pincho told one person. He lived with his mother on Rhode Island Avenue, and he told his mother. He wore black for a year after his beloved died, and then one day he showed up, the black, he was not wearing black, and he had a skip in his step. And his mother said, what's up with you, Gifford? He said, I'm married. 
And she said, what? He said, yes, Laura and I are now sealed for eternity. And she said, don't you ever bring this up again. <laughs> she said, you will not be married to a dead person. So he never brought it up again. So one person knew his secret, his mother. And again, then a scholar deciphered it 10 years ago. I wonder, though, Roosevelt was um, not exactly a romantic, though he did love the outdoors, and he loved poetry, and he, was, he had so many interests. I mean, anyone who comes to Roosevelt sort of cold does sort of fall in love with him because his interests were so broad. But um, I think if he knew this, he would have slapped Pincho around. And I have a scene, by the way, where they're boxing in their undies. It's when they first meet, and, and Roosevelt is governor in Albany, and, and it's a winter night, and Pincho meets him. And you know, they're, they're sort of strange guys. They don't want to have a drink. They don't want to do They want to fight. So they strip down to their underpants and, and box for 45 minutes, and then they take a break, and they wrestle. And Pincho writes later in his diary, I had, I, I'm a modest man, but I had the distinct pleasure of knocking the future president of the United States on his pins. <laughs> yes. Thank you for both of your books. They were very easy to read and brings history alive. I'm interested in your thoughts. In The Worst Hard Time, I think you give a, a very vivid description of the role that government policy in terms of homesteading and agriculture policy contributed to the conditions that led to the Dust Bowl. And you know, given the, the contributing factors towards climate change today, what, what are your observations in terms of some kind of <laughs> well, catalystic the old, the event? tricky climate change before. question. Well, they actually did change the climate in the Dust Bowl. I mean, they, they ripped up an area, more than 100 million acres, an area you know, bigger than the size of Pennsylvania that was part of the greatest grassland the world had ever known. I mean, you had these, this delicate ecosystem evolved over 10,000 years. You had 30 million bison roamed over it, these great you know, herbivores who only needed grass to survive. You had Native Americans who only needed buffalo to kill, and you know, everybody got along pretty well. Um, this was the last great bit of settlement. More people homesteaded in the 20th century than homesteaded in the 19th, because they doubled the Homestead Act to try to get everyone to take up this land that had been called the Great American Desert. And I don't blame these people, because these were the people who were kicked around all over the globe. They were the Scots-Irish who had been the cannon fodder on the Confederate side of the Civil War. They were, you know, people, Latinos who came up from the South. They were uh, Germans who didn't own land in old Germany, and they transported their whole villages intact from Germany or the Russian steppe and just plopped them down on the American Midwest, in some cases with the same name of the town. So you have a Pfeiffer or a Catherine Stadt that's moved from Russia or Germany and plopped down into Kansas. And they never owned a piece of dirt in their life. No one in their family had ever. So I don't blame the people for getting in on this last great homestead act. It was a, it was a marvelous thing. And for a while, it all looked like it was going to work. But it didn't. The rain stopped coming. This is a dry area. You can't farm there. It's meant to be grass. It's meant for cattle or bison. You can't tear up this ground. So in very short order, it's, it's a mini parable of climate change. It really is. And, and this isn't me who came to this conclusion. This isn't, these aren't scholars. These aren't people who are on the payroll of Al Gore. The farmers and the women and men who lived through this era, who I was so privileged to spend so much time with, they're leaving the planet now. They're all in their 90s. They have this story inside of them. I was so privileged to be able to sit down in their homes in Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas and hear these stories. They told me they screwed up. They told me they pushed nature too far. So when people ask me about the climate change question, it's really simple. We, they did change the climate. They changed an entire ecosystem, and nature got its revenge. It's what I said earlier about nature bats last. And it doesn't take a scholar or it doesn't take a politician on the payroll to one of the big green agencies to tell you this. These farmers told, told me this because they saw it happen. So I think we all need to, I, by the way, I was really glad. When my son was taking um, AP history in high school, I looked at his history book, real thick history book, and I opened it up to the index to Dust Bowl. I was right in the middle of my research. They had one paragraph on the Dust Bowl in the AP history book. I was shocked. And now, you know, so many people have taken to this story. Um, Ken Burns is doing it as a documentary next year, uh, and he'll bring it to a lot of people as well. So, I mean, a lot of people see this story for what it is, a man-caused disaster that has so many great threads of history in it. So I'm glad to see we're trying to learn from it. And also, one final thing. Again, I was so privileged to talk to those people before they left us. They were just remarkable folks. 
they were a little hard to get going after a while, but um, especially the men who tend not to emote or talk unless you're talking sports. Um, but they were just, just fabulous. I guess I have time for one more question. Um, my question is about urban fires. Uh -huh. I evacuated our home almost 20 years ago in Oakland, California, yep. as we saw the flames come across. Originally from the East Coast, couldn't really grasp the idea that a fire could jump freeways, burn 3,000 homes, and devastate a city. I understand the idea of the Forest Service focusing on large kinds of forest fires, but what about the urban fires that go on? Th that's a great question. The number one thing that's sucking up all the money in the public land agencies right now is fighting what they call the urban wildland interface, and it's really simple. In the last generation, 20 million people have moved into areas next to public land, next to BLM or Forest Service land, that's part of a natural fire zone. Nature wants to burn in those areas. These are forests that need to burn in some cases every 20 years for the trees to regenerate. So you suddenly have 20 million Americans living in this fire zone. There, you know, the land didn't change, we changed. We moved to the fire zone. And they often get upset at the public lands agencies and they don't like some of the rules and that, but as soon as a fire breaks out, they want them there immediately. They want them there to save them. So it's, it's an ongoing education and I've covered a lot of fires in the West dating to the Yellowstone fire of more than 20 years ago. And We've learned a lot. I think people are starting to realize that if you're going to live in that zone, you're going to have certain things on your roof. You're going to have a little, you know, a little protection zone. Um, you know, it, it's different than the East Coast. It really is. You are living in the fire zone. That's what it is. Anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's a privilege to be here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.